So there are a couple of, of kind of commonplace myths uh, that I'd like to talk about uh, to, to, to kind of finish up this primer, and then we'll have time for a few questions. So myth number one is that cops have to identify themselves, and they can't lie to you. And this is, su this is surprisingly widespread, uh, and I think it goes back to the 60s, uh, if not before. But it, it's totally wrong. You know, Undercover infiltrators, of course, work by keeping their identity a secret. You wouldn't have undercover cops in biker gangs if they had to explain, you know, whenever they're asked if they're a police officer, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cop, I'm just going to... You know, head off now. It doesn't work that way. Um, so police, uh, intelligence officers, FBI, they can and do lie to people all the time to encourage their compliance, um, to threaten them, and for many other reasons. Myth number two is that we have to identify the feds and that there's, you know, if we're in a group, that security culture depends on being able to pick out who is the infiltrator, who's the informer. And that's not what it's about. Um, above ground groups function by being open enough that we can communicate with many different people, that we can mobilize different many people, uh, many different people, um, that we can you know bring in the greater numbers. And so you can never be sure if you're organizing openly whether someone's going to be an informer or an infiltrator. And security culture is based on the idea that we can follow certain rules and still be relatively safe, even if you know there's someone around listening who shouldn't be. Um, so. I think what, what often happens when people kind of try to play the, the point out the Fed game <laughs> is that they get into this cycle of, of kind of paranoia and divisive behavior that can be really destructive to groups. Um, there's actually a term for, for kind of falsely accusing someone of being a, a snitch or speculating, and that's called bad jacketing. And it was something that's been really extensively used by police infiltrators since the 60s, if not before. So if there's a, an infiltrator in a group or an informer, one of the first things that they'll do is say, you know, I think that person over there is, is a police infiltrator as a way of deflecting attention from themselves and also trying to kind of break down the trust of the group. Um, and so that can be really damaging. And the goal is to follow good security culture, not to, you know, try to speculate. And again, you know, different groups have different ways of dealing with bad behavior and more closed groups. You know, if I want to form a, an affinity group, then I'm probably going to want to pick people that I, that I know and trust anyway. Um, so I'm not going to pick someone who I think is, is you know, uh, going to have any kinds of destructive behavior, um, including you know, bad security culture. OK, myth number three, security culture guarantees my safety. And this is a bit of a tough one, because you know, security culture makes us safer but you can never say it makes you 100% safe. And if you're going to resist those in power, or if you're going to organize politically, then nothing is going to make you 100% safe. Because whether you are you know, a victim of surveillance or repression is not based on whether you're doing illegal actions or not. Um, it's based on whether you're effective at confronting and disrupting power. So if what you're doing is working, then those in power are probably going to go after you and try to disrupt you and try to stop you. So it doesn't matter whether you're above ground or not. Um, so in that sense, security culture, the goal isn't to make us safe, um, it's to make us effective. And so that when we're taking a risk, we can get as much done as possible with the risk that we're taking. And then we can make as much change as possible, even in the face of repression. And so this, you know, this above ground and underground divide really exists to, to protect people and to make sure that the above ground and underground are following the rules that will make them the most effective in the kind of work that they're doing. Um, and for above grounders, that those kind of guidelines are really based in security culture. And myth number four, this is the last one, that if you're above ground, that, that hiding my identity makes me safe. And this is kind of based on emails that we often get when we're doing kind of registration for you know, workshops or conferences that people will say, well, you know, I, uh, I am not going to register with my real name because uh, I don't want to be on a list somewhere or something like that. And if you've sent us an email, then it's already a little bit late for that. I mean, you know, if you want to uh, send us you know, a made up name and go into the post office and get a money order and send that or whatever to register, that's fine. 
but don't send us an email with from your actual address explaining why that's a problem. Um, so, you know, and that said, keeping a low profile is totally valid. That if someone, you know, wants to reduce the amount of attention, especially if they're in a precarious personal situation that they might get from the state, that's fine. Um, and you should do that, but do it kind of quietly on your own terms. Um, this is an above ground kind of event. Um, and so if you are considering really serious action, if you're considering, you know, underground action or being in an underground group, then you should not be attending kind of open, especially open radical political events, um, because that's something that will, you know, blow your cover and that make it, make it more dangerous for you and, and any group that you participate in. Um, so, you know, when we're working above ground, we can protect ourselves through a low profile, but it's in the underground where secrecy is really the main method of protection. Above ground, we actually protect ourselves through numbers and solidarity, so that uh, there are so many of us um, that it's actually difficult to arrest everyone. And if people are, are arrested or attacked, then there's a large support community there to stand up for them and to support them and their community. So, we have uh, just a couple of minutes for, for clarifying questions about this primer. So, oh, do we have, Mention yes. Of a pamphlet that, um, <coughs> yes. So, the question is, what's the name of the pamphlet that I mentioned earlier? And it's called Security Culture, a Handbook for Activists. And if you go to deepgreenresistance.org, uh, there's a link to it there. There's a copy there. Um, what can I recommend in terms of safe methods to reach out to sympathizers? Um, and so I think that's really situational and really depends on the kind of group that you're in and the kind of action that you want to undertake. So, you know, if someone's undertaking kind of really uh, risky action or, or action for which there's a, a serious risk of repression or arrest, then you might want to do that on, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face basis strictly. Um, and do that really through the, the community that's already there, of people that you know and trust. Um, anything that you're doing kind of online, you can assume is, is surveilled or is surveillable, um, or at least being you know, recorded for kind of later reference. So that's, um, you know, online outreach is totally a, a, a functional and effective way of, of reaching people, depending on what you're going for. Uh, and you know, again, it's a matter of, of, of numbers, that if you think that the, that, you, that the best way is to get as many people as possible, that that's kind of the safest way and what will offer you the most protection as a community or for your, for your you know, action group, then that's the way to go. And if you're not gonna get those numbers, um, then you wanna take more kind of subtle outreach measures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.